Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Dennis Ward. A Senate committee is studying the issue of the Elver fishery in the Maritimes. It's a lucrative business as Elvers or baby eels can fetch $5,000 a kilogram. The Department of Fisheries and Oceans shut down the fishery in March. DFO Minister Diane Leboutier cited a need for conservation and the rise in violence related to illegal harvesting as reasons for the closure. Commercial eel harvesters were witnesses at the Senate's Committee on Fisheries and Oceans. Brian Giroux is the president of Shelburne Elfer. He said in two years, his tax-paying fishery lost $1 million. He said there's an increasing number of First Nations groups fishing without licenses and suggests better enforcement and stricter regulations for First Nations. That way we have a backstop for negotiation because there are bands, some bands right now that are not willing to negotiate anything. They have a right to do whatever they want and they feel they will go and do it whatever they want without reporting catches, without paying attention to conservation rules, fishing right against fish ladders and dams and you name it, breaking every conservation rule in the book and that's not right. Meanwhile, this past March, two Mi'kmaq men allegedly harvested baby eels despite the federal ban on doing so. Department of Fisheries and Oceans officers detained them and eventually left them at a gas station in the middle of the night. But not before they confiscated their shoes and cell phones. Both Senator Paul Prosper and Liberal MP Jaime Batiste want an independent Mi'kmaq-led investigation into the incident. Kevin Hartling and Blaise Silliboy are both seen here at a rally in early April. Their supporters were demonstrating against the treatment of the two men by DFO officers. Hartling and Silly Boy claimed to have walked for hours without proper footwear. APTN caught up with Minister Leboutier before a fisheries committee this week and asked her if the officers involved in the incident have been suspended. Ben écoutez, ce que je peux vous dire, c'est que je l'ai, puis je l'ai dit depuis le début, c'est inacceptable d'avoir laissé euh, des gens euh, euh, dans la dans la situation euh, où ça s'est passé. Il y a du travail qui a été fait de ma part. J'ai rencontré des chefs autochtones, j'ai rencontré des euh, des sénateurs, et on va travailler ensemble avec les communautés autochtones à mettre un comité en place pour pouvoir vraiment avoir des, des meilleures de meilleures façons de travailler pour euh, les gens de ministère des Pêches. To the fire situation now and starting in British Columbia where some 3,000 people have been forced out of their homes because of a wildfire burning out of control. A tree falling down on a power line caused a fire and when our fire crews got there it was just a few acres and within a couple hours it was uh, you know it was well over 30 hectares and, and moving. The fast-growing Parker Lake fire has grown to over 2,800 hectares in size and is now just a few kilometers west of Fort Nelson. The fire was sparked Friday afternoon and some people were given just minutes to leave their homes. Meantime, the mayor of the region of Wood Buffalo, Alberta, has given that community a pep talk as it faces a potentially devastating wildfire. Our region has shown tremendous resiliency and courage in the past and I know we will all pull together to help our family, friends and neighbours. The most, most important thing you can do is to remain prepared, stay calm and stay informed. Sandy Bowman reminding people that while it is a stressful time, past experience also means the community is prepared to handle the situation. The wildfire is just 16 kilometers southwest of Fort McMurray. An evacuation alert remains in place for the city, but further south, some residents in TP Creek have already been told to leave. Now, the wildfires in BC and Alberta are making for some hazy skies across parts of the country. Environment Canada issued air quality statements across much of Alberta. Parts of southern Saskatchewan and Manitoba stretching into parts of northwestern Ontario. In northern Manitoba, about 500 people are being forced from their homes in Cranberry Portage near the mining town of Flin Flon. 
The wildfire was first detected on Thursday and is growing rapidly because of high winds and drought conditions. It has caused power outages and road closures. However, officials say it appears the fire has not increased in size. Well, all of this brings us now to one of our web poll questions this week. Wildfire season is here. We were asking you, do you have an emergency kit ready in case you need to evacuate your home? Yes, no, or my community isn't affected by wildfires are your options. You can weigh in on our weekly poll questions over on our website, aptnnews.ca. A series of powerful solar storms is slamming Earth, creating dazzling displays of northern lights, but also causing some satellite and communication disruptions. This was the scene over Vancouver where the northern lights were not even expected to be seen, but the sky was filled with a spectacular display of Aurora Borealis. The fact that you can see the northern lights in Vancouver, it tells the whole story. I mean, Vancouver is not north. That is basically on the southern border of Canada. You shouldn't be able to see northern lights there. And the fact that you could really speaks to what a spectacular event this was. And I've talked to friends in Alberta and Saskatchewan who say that it was just a breath to behold, just a, just a beautiful sight. Métis artist Jenny, Janini uh, Crouchy recently won the Manitoba Arts Council Award of Distinction. Our reporter Sierra Benton sat down with Crouchy to discuss her work and legacy. There's something about beadwork and something about doing beadwork that just brings you back to, to who you are and to be proud of who you are. For over 40 years, Janine Crouchy has dedicated her life to sharing the art of Métis beadwork with the world. This week, the Manitoba Arts Council honored Crouchy with their 2024 Award of Distinction. The $30,000 prize is given annually to an artist who embodies both artistic excellence and community service. Audrey Dwyer, the director of granting, said Crouchy was a perfect candidate. When it comes to the Manitoba Arts Council, we want to award someone who not only exceeds artistic excellence, but also contributes to the development of art in Manitoba, which is something that Janine also does. Crouchy, a Red River Métis woman, learned to bead from her mother, Janine Meyer. To date, Crouchy's work has been displayed at the Winnipeg Art Gallery, Canadian Museum for Human Rights, and on two Royal Canadian Mint Collector's coins. However, in Canadian institutions, beadwork wasn't always celebrated. Our beadwork was kept in drawers at, at museums and, uh, you know, every once in a while somebody would be interested and, you know, pull that drawer out and, and have a look. But Croce says there's been a surge of interest in beadwork and more and more young people are eager to learn it. For Croce, beadwork is a collaborative medium. As she watches the new generation of beadworkers flourish, she dedicates the award to them and the women that paved the way. The women that came before us that did this beautiful work and uh, they never got the recognition for it. So I, in a lot of ways, I dedicate this award to them because without them, I wouldn't be doing what I do now. Next week, Crouchy's work will be featured at the Radical Stitch Exhibition at the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa. Sierra Benton's APTN National News, Winnipeg. Cool stuff, congrats. Well, new rules south of the medicine line have museums scrambling. Details on that and more coming up after the break. Welcome back. Now to a story from our colleagues in the U.S. ICT News. It's about new rules that are governing the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act known as NAGPRA, went into effect this year and they pack a wallop. They center Indigenous voices and dramatically change how museums and other institutions interact with Indigenous peoples when it comes to repatriations of ancestral remains and sacred objects. ICT's Stuart Huntington has more on the change. 
The new rule sent museums across the country scrambling to hide some indigenous items from public view as officials worked to comply with changes to the law. We've been living with uh, the regulations which were originally passed in 1995, uh, and they've been horrible. They have they didn't even define the term consultation. So institutions have been able to use the past regulations to really just absolve themselves of any responsibility under NAGPRA. So these brand new regulations that went into effect on January 12 are a complete change. They're a sea change from what the regulations were. The new regulations, published in the Federal Register, mandate a fundamental shift in priorities at institutions. The Field Museum in Chicago and the Peabody Museum at Harvard have blocked off exhibits. The American Museum of Natural History in New York closed two major halls. Right behind me here used to be the entrance to the Eastern Woodlands and Great Plains halls. They are both now closed to the public. There were about 1,600 objects uh, that uh, fell into the category of either funerary object or uh, sacred object or cultural patrimony. Uh, and it really felt appropriate both because of the, the scale uh, of the objects that were there, uh, but also because those were halls that were not consistent with the, you know, our current framework and expectation about how Native voices are included in the narrative and the story. So we made the decision to, uh, to close two of our halls. A lot of museums are like freaking out. They're looking around and saying, we better take this stuff off of display. Some of this has a question mark. What if um, it's determined that this actually is funerary related? We could be in trouble. And so there have been some museums that have taken things off of display. And there have been quite a few that have been re-examining their inventory and making sure they have done their due diligence to communicate um, and even understand their own holdings. NAGPRA was passed by Congress in 1990 to protect Native graves and ensure repatriation of remains and cultural patrimony through consultation with tribes, Native Hawaiians, and Alaska Natives. But the law lacked teeth. Institutions held on to remains and items using terms like unaffiliated or unidentifiable. Native peoples have long complained. Institutions were uh, simply declaring collections of ancestors and their burial belongings as, as unaffiliated, even though there was information in the record, even just geography is enough. And so the, the new regulations uh, not only close that loophole, they do away with the term of culturally unidentifiable. And the institutions who created those culturally unidentifiable lists are going to have to go back and actually do the consultation that they were supposed to do to begin with. In addition, the new rules give deference to indigenous knowledge, a critical change, and they require public organizations to obtain free, prior, and informed consent from tribes before exhibiting cultural items. They also set a five-year deadline for compliance. We're really excited to see the work that's going to be done under these new regulations. We hope that institutions will finally get the drift of what they're supposed to do with NAGPRA. For the longest time, they simply sat on their hands. Uh, after all, they are the ones who are in possession of stolen property. They are the ones who have the legal obligations under NAGPRA. Stuart Huntington, ICT News. Thanks to our colleagues at ICT for that story. Well, we're always looking for your feedback or story ideas. Here's how you can continue the conversation. If you have a story you want to share, send us an email to news at aptn.ca. To read and watch our stories, you can go to our website. That's aptnnews.ca. You can find us online on your favorite social media sites, including TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn, and X. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. Author and curator Paul C. Quasis has a new photo book out. We'll speak with him after the break.
Welcome back. Here's a look at your current weather conditions starting on the East Coast. 8 and sunny in Halifax, 11 for Fredericton. Cloudy and one above in Kuduak, plus 5 for Nain. 15 in Montreal with cloudy skies, 10 and cloud in Val d'Or. Sun's out and 7 in Sault Ste. Marie, 14 in North Bay. 8 in Thunder Bay, cloudy and 2 for Sioux Lookout. Minus one in God's Lake, zero in Norway House. Sunny and plus five here in Winnipeg, seven and cloudy in Dauphin. Eight with cloud in Regina, 11 in Saskatoon. 11 in Meadow Lake, sunny and six in Buffalo Narrows. In Northern Alberta, cloudy and 10 for a high level, seven and sunny in Fort Chippewan. Nine under the sun in Edmonton, 25 already in Lethbridge. 13 in Vancouver, 11 in Victoria. Sun's out and 8 in Prince George, cloudy and 6 in Smithers. Minus 3 in Old Crow, 0 in Whitehorse. 7 in Cloudy and Yellowknife, cloudy and 3 in Norman Wells. Plus 3 in Cloud in Saks Harbor and Politak. Minus 12 in Chesterfield, 8 below in Whale Cove. Minus 13 and snow in Resolute, minus 14 in Igloolik. Cree author and curator Paul C.C. Quasis is back with a new photo book. It's called People of the Watershed, photographs by John McPhee. It transports readers back in time and shines a light on the overlooked histories and enduring legacies of Indigenous communities in Northern Ontario. We spoke with Paul earlier. Paul, thanks so much for taking the time. Always a pleasure to get to have a chance to speak with you. It's a pleasure for me as well, Dennis. It's nice to talk to you again. Uh, what can you tell us about John McPhee and the, uh, the photos that he took? A very interesting uh, gentleman. Uh, John McPhee was uh, also a photographer, which is very fortunate. I came across John McPhee a number of years ago when I was working on doing research for Blanket Toss Under Midnight Sun, which was a photo book I had that came out in 2019. And John McPhee was one of the chapters in the book. And just so people know what we're talking about here, John McPhee was a, a trap line manager, which in the 50s and 1960s, for a whole decade, he traveled through uh, the watershed area, the watershed area of Northwestern Ontario, through all the Anishinaabe, Cree, and the Sinu communities up there. He was there for a whole decade. And during that time, he just took these amazing collection of photo community photographs that I'm very proud to see now coming together at the McMichael Canadian Art Collection as the first photo, his first photo ex ex exhibition. Well, I was lucky myself to live up there for about a decade and uh, the beautiful pictures, uh, about 150 of them. Uh, when I look at them, they kind of reminds me of uh, a simpler time for sure. Uh, what are some of the things that stuck out for you in the photos? And that's incredible. You just hit the nail on the head, Dennis. It is that time. This is 50s and 60s in this region. This is pre-television. It's obviously pre-cell phones and computers. Uh, there's no GPS. People are out on the land. Uh, there's radio, but not much else. The languages are much stronger, of course. And um, it's just a lifestyle. This was a time of uh, John McPhee did a lot of traveling between and among these communities by dog sled in the winter, by canoes in the summer, by bush plane when they could. Uh, there were no hotels in these communities at those times. He would, you know, take a blanket, you know, a roll with him and sleep at the HBC store or wherever it was. And over the course of a decade, he developed a close friendship with many people in these communities. And that, for me, is what these makes these photographs both so important and so intimate in, because they capture Indigenous life through this whole region, such an important region of Ontario. Uh, through that period and it's I haven't seen a collection like this in my years of looking at photography so it's so exciting to see it here. It's funny you mentioned the you know it's the 1950s or so but uh, looking at them now you almost think that it's it must be centuries ago almost. It does feel that way uh, it's so interesting uh, you see the differences in the community 
you see the differences in fashion. And there's some great photos. Uh, uh, there's a, a man in overalls and, you know, just doing some work. Uh, but he's wearing this beautiful beaded belt. So people were the fashion, people, you know, even if there's two people to see you, uh, the, the, basically the thing that people would wear. It really, um, it's, it's, it's just uh, an amazing thing to see. And uh, yeah, I think it also really is a testament to the, the strength and dignity of people through these times. You know, these weren't easy times in the 50s and 60s. Many people will be familiar uh, with the previous work that you mentioned there, Blanket Toss Under Midnight Sun, that looked at everyday life in eight Indigenous communities through archival photos like this. This is all part of the Indigenous Archival Photo Project. Can you give us a, a bit more on that project itself? I'm happy to, Des. Uh, I curated the Indigenous, uh, the Indigenous Photo Project, Archive Pro Photo Project. It's been going on about uh, 10 years now. And it's an online project uh, looking at archive, archival collections of photography of indigenous people, going from the early 1900s up to the 19 up to 1970s, through archives, museums, and what I've done is taking taking these images uh, and we've used social media, primarily Facebook, because that's where a lot of people in communities are. And we've been able to identify people. That's my auntie. That's my uncle. Mm -hmm. And out of that, this whole narrative of people, people's memories uh, of the person or of that, of that time that I did, or of the time that photo was taken, have created their own story. So it's a way of uh, community storytelling as well that connects, that brings the photographs back to life. And that's the most, I, I view it as a connector. It's a big connector to, uh, bring the photos back to the communities and let the communities kind of tell their story about these photos. Because these photos are in museums or archive collections in big cities, usually in the South. So it's a way of bringing them home. Absolutely. Uh, give Paul a follow on Facebook and X or Twitter because he's uh, always tweeting out some uh, amazing photographs. Uh, Paul, uh, wish you all the best with this latest work. Uh, always a pleasure. It's a pleasure again, and uh, thank you so much, Dennis. You have a great day. And People of the Watershed is out and available now. Well, that's all the time we have for your APTN National News for this afternoon. You can find much more over on our website, of course, aptnnews.ca. And we'll be back here again at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. I'm Dennis Ward, Marcy McGuitch. Thanks for being with us. I'll see you again in a couple of hours.